OK, good stuff. Um, right, hello, everyone. So I'm James Banks. I head up the membership department at CIET. Some of these names around look vaguely familiar. So you may well have seen me while you're at, when you're at university. And I'm assuming most of you are either due to graduate this year or you graduated in the summer just gone. Um, so I'll give you a brief rundown about how you can go and qualify with CIET, what the routes are, what requirements you need to demonstrate and how you can get to chartership. Ultimately, you know, professional qualifications with any organisation are for the benefit of the individual primarily. So you're the main beneficiary of being a qualified charter professional, whether it's with CIAT or any other body. So it's a global marketplace. You know, science and technology is driving all industries forward. So within the architectural industry, architectural technology as a discipline is well placed to evolve change to drive the industry forward. And architectural technology graduates or qualified, experienced chartered architectural technologists are in high demand. So there's global opportunities wherever you may end up or wherever you aspire to practice. Um, sometimes a picture paints a thousand words. So I always use this slide because people always ask me, oh, James, what's, what's the general difference between an architect and an architectural technologist in their viewpoint and how they perceive a building? This is quite a good image because on the left hand side, you've generally got an architect's perspective. It's the initial design concept this is a spectacle look at the building it's how it's going to sit in the environment and how it's how it's going to look and then on the right hand side you've almost got the analytical viewpoint of an architectural technology professional you're sort of going to start breaking that building down into the science and technology that are going to enable it to meet the project parameters and end up similar to that computer generated image on the left hand side always remember Technologists can be strong on the design side and architects can be strong on the technical side. So there's a lot of cross fertilization between the two disciplines and generally in practice, you'll work quite closely with the respective professions to enable the project to be delivered in an efficient manner, in a professional manner and against the requirements of the client's brief. So joining and qualifying. So most people I assume either are a student or were a student or a student that should upgrade to associate member. So student membership is free for the duration of any studies related to a career in architectural technology. Once you graduate, you should upgrade to the next level, which is your associate membership with CIAT. Um, it's a five minute process to upgrade to associate and you can do it through our website. Um, if any of you were a student member with us and you graduated this year, then there is a promotional upgrade incentive rate to help you in your first year in practice. So it's £145 instead of £200 to register as an associate member um, and you just do it through the website and if you email me after this event then I can send you the promo code to put in on the application form but it's only for registered student members that upgraded this summer for this year and or if you're going to upgrade next summer then obviously you can get the rate next summer. So associate member is sort of your stepping stone you're going through the spine of CIAT so you're going the student if you want to put a better analogy is the football team, the students in defence, you're coming into midfield as an associate member and then your end goal or your end aspiration is to be the striker and get your chartered status. So you're going to follow that standard spine within CIAT, student associate to chartership. Um, a lot of graduates say to me, right James, what, what's the standard progression for an AT graduate? And it's a fair question. I would always say to you, everyone's slightly different. You're all going to work in different spheres of the built environment. You're going to have slightly different strengths and weaknesses. You're going to have different opportunities with different employers. So ultimately, it's as long or as short as you feel it's necessary for you to submit an apply. But as a general rule, you study three years for a full time degree. Then you go out to industry as an associate member and you build up your experience, putting into practice the knowledge you've attained through your degree and developing that against real life examples through project delivery. And then over a course of time, which could be a minimum of two years post graduation to anything through to five or 10 years, then you can be in a position to admit for char uh, sub submit for chartership. So I know graduates with two years good experience from a good employer that's given them a good exposure, they've been able to become a charter member in a total of five years. But it might take you three years, it might take you four years, you know, it really is as and when you get that experience and you feel comfortable in your competency to submit and to chain your chartered status. But this is the standard progression mechanism for an AT graduate. Obviously benefits or advantages of being registered or a member is quite a subjective one. Everyone will see different benefits of why they might want to be affiliated. Your employer might want you to be a professional member with CIAT at whichever level you are or you're working towards. 
obviously we're here as your umbrella representative body for the profession and the discipline. So we set the standards for education, practice and professionalism within architectural technology. We've got approximately 10,000 members and affiliates and therefore we have a stronger collective voice than you as one individual architectural technology professional. So we are here as your representative body. Um, we provide guidance and information when changes in legislation are coming. Um, when there's consultations on changing to building regulations, again, we're here to represent you as a profession and any views will be welcome and they'll always be sent out to members to engage and get their viewpoints on it so we can consolidate our response to government. Obviously, there's CPD and site visits. Uh, there's networking, professional and social to help you build your own network within the built environment. Obviously, there's the chartered status that has its recognition and parity with any other chartered professional within the built environment. We try and give you support and guidance to qualify. We've got specialist qualifications available in time. Uh, we've got a mentoring platform called Mentor Match Me, employment opportunities through AT Jobs and our collaboration with Hayes Recruitment. And as I alluded to earlier, we have the student to associate promotional upgrade incentive as well. Now, one good way you could possibly get involved with CIAT in your local area is if you are future professionals network. So it's called Aspiration. Um, and it's designed to be a conduit for student members or graduates or future professionals or those about to qualify to have a voice to steer CIAT in their local area. And we will give each region a set budget to invest in events. And you can cross collaborate with other organisations like CIOB Novus, RICS Matrix and have joint events. And it's designed to be a mix of professional and social with a bit of fun to help you build up your network within the discipline. So whichever region you might fall into, you will have an aspiration chair. You may well have some other people on the committee, but I know all aspiration groups generally would always welcome more people to get involved with their local area and help drive it forward for the benefit of everyone who's an aspiring professional within architectural technology. So to qualify as a chartered member, uh, the route that the majority take is what we call the uh, professional assessment and it's cross-referenced against a document called the professional standards framework. So in the group chat, there should be a copy of the professional standards framework that you can access and there should be two graduate examples of how they've demonstrated their experience against the professional assessment requirements. So anyone with a CIAT accredited honours or master's degree, so you, you should know if you've got one of those, stage one educational standards, you're exempt from that section, you don't need to answer it. We know you've got the knowledge and understanding because you've graduated with our accredited degree qualification. Stage two is your practice standard. So this is an assessment of your work based experience and you will need to build up a portfolio to show you the range, breadth and depth of your experience that you've attained within the built environment or within the architectural project delivery process. And the four areas defined within the practice standards are designing, managing, practicing and self development. Furthermore, stage three, where we assess your professional standards, which relates to code of conduct, uh, professional ethics, continual professional development, knowing your limitations and the like, that is covered via a professional interview and they're all held be, being held remotely at the moment. In an ideal world, they'll be face to face because it's better for you and it's better for the assessors. However, needs must and they can always be held remotely anyway. And as I alluded to earlier, so chartered status, so whether you're a chartered architect technologist, a chartered engineer, a chartered accountant, whatever it might be, by having that accolade, it's a globally recognised standard of your excellence and it benchmarks your knowledge, your experience and your professionalism. So it's almost like a global currency of professionalism that will enable you to have additional opportunities in the future that should make you more employable and also enable you to have a more healthy salary and remuneration package. You know, the more experienced you are, the better qualified you are, the more in demand you should be. So it's in your interest to get that qualification. So I don't know whether everyone in this chat has an accredited degree. So just in case you don't, so let's say you've got an RIBA part one or you've got a, a construction management degree, you're not exempt from our educational requirements because it's not an accredited programme. So we don't know the module content. So you're going to need to extrapolate and draw out your knowledge and understanding of our respective requirements outlined in stage one, where and how you've got that knowledge. So you can refer back to the academic qualification and the module content. You might have an alternative professional qualification. You might have done some CPD or some training courses. You might have read some articles or manuals or literature on a subject, or you might have picked it up through your career from your colleagues. 
that's all good ways to attain knowledge and know-how, but you need to put it down in a structured logical format so that we can understand your theory of the process. So through the qualifying process, you appoint a referee. So the referee will be a qualified professional, generally someone at the same level or more senior to you who can give you the additional exposure and experience you need to qualify and also make a judgment as to whether they feel you've met our requirements to submit for chartered status. Um, generally, you've got a good idea of who that might be. So it might be a chartered architect, chartered architect, technologist, chartered building surveyor, chartered construction manager. Now, there's a long list of professions we accept to be your referee, but have a think about who might help you on that journey and vouch for you and help give you that experience to qualify. So the main crux for most of you is going to be your stage two portfolio. So that's your practice based evidence, really, that you're going to build up either through your year out of university, whether you studied part time and wherever you're working at the moment, you need to start recording. Projects you've worked on, what what projects they were, what you did in those projects, why they're relevant to our requirements, how you did it and provide documents to prove it. Now, when I say documents to prove it, it's all well and good saying, you know, I designed this scheme from inception through to completion. I dealt with every stage. That's fine, but you need to prove it. So you need to show us the initial design concept if you're involved in that, the presentation to the client, the agreement with the client. If you submitted and were involved in a planning application, we need to see the whole planning application package. If you did a building regulation submission, we need to see all the evidence you've submitted to ensure that that package was appropriate. If you had to comply with CDM, well, you will have to comply with CDM, but if you're involved in the CDM process, you need to provide evidence of that. Developing a specification, contract admin, stakeholder liaison. This is all stuff that you probably do every day, but you need to start building it up into a professional portfolio to show us the range of your experience within architectural technology and the architectural delivery process. Now, the idea is you appoint the referee to help you through this process. So there might be things that you don't do now, but you want to do in time. And the idea is you work with this qualified professional to have a structured development program so that over a set period of say 12 to 18 months, you've got exposure and experience in your workflow to enable you to submit to become a chartered member. But ultimately you need to keep a note of where all this evidence is kept and you should be keeping it electronically. Whether you do that on a Dropbox folder, we transfer just on your desktop or on a USB, that's really up to you. Um, but once you've filled it in, you've provided a narrative around your suitability and backed it up with evidence then you can ask your referee to review it and sign off the relevant aspects that they're happy for you to proceed. Um, another question I generally get asked from some technology graduates is, you know, James, our practice doesn't do the whole project process from start to finish. We may be specialised in one area, such as building information modelling, as an example, or you might just do RIBA work stages three, four and five or four, five and six. So a good benchmark to see where you are now, where you could get exposure to in your current employer is the RIBA plan of works and all the relevant stages. Now we will enable people to qualify as a chartered member without having to tick every box of the RIBA plan of works experience wise. You do need to have an awareness of the relevance of your role within your organisation and how that fits into the plan of work puzzle and that we just do four, five and six, but these people or these professionals do the, the earlier stages and this is my awareness of every stage and how that affects what I do and what I deliver. Um, another, another question I always get is, well, you know, what sphere of practice could I put forward? So when we're talking about practicing in stage two, you could hone in on historic building conservation. You could have some exp experience in interior design. You could be particularly skilled in sustainability, or you might specialise in project management. These are all facets of practice that you can implement into the stage two practice standards of designing, managing, practising to show your portfolio and your skills. On the flip side as well, to make your application stronger, you should try and provide a range of different building typologies you worked on. So all of these areas of buildings will have slightly different client requirements, regulatory parameters and different skills that they test you in. So the broader range you can provide within your professional application for chartership, the stronger your application will be. So if you primarily focus in residential, but you've got some retail and some commercial with a bit of leisure, all of that will make your application stronger, if you see what I mean. 
it's almost like a pick and mix. You're going to cherry pick what you feel best proves your experience in a certain area in a certain way. And the more you can add to it, the stronger your application is going to be with regards to breadth and depth of capability. Uh, the final stage before you become chartered. So you fill in your professional assessment application in your workplace. Stage one, if you're exempt, that's fine. If not, you need to get your referee to sign it off. Stage two, you will need to do that. Build up your experience in your portfolio. Once your referee signs it off, you send the professional assessment electronically back to CIET. We look for all your evidence and your explanations and we can make a judgment as to whether it's acceptable. If we're not happy first time round, we call, we call it a deferral. We will ask for further clarification or extra evidence of certain points. And you get to resubmit three times to meet the requirements to then be invited to interview. But if you pass first time round, second time round or third time round at the portfolio submission, all of you will come through for a professional interview. And the paragraph near the underneath the bullet point summarise it quite nicely for me. Your professional interview is based around the information in your application, relates to your professional background in architectural technology, your knowledge and understanding of the project delivery process, your experience, your professionalism. So it's your interview about you and there's no better person in the world than you to sit your interview because it's about what's where, whatever's in your application. So the main thing I would say is make sure you're honest. We don't need to know everything. Nobody knows any everything these days. It's about knowing your limitations. It's about going, knowing when to say I need to find out for you. I will report back to you and this is how I would find out. Uh, the code of conduct is quite clear on that. There's a suite of films you can see about the interview member case studies at the level of what they're delivering and the award films that will be coming out soon. Um, and it lasts for 45 minutes. They're done via Zoom at the moment and it's a two way engaged discussion. Rest assured it is not a dragon's den scenario where they're literally trying to pick holes in everything that you say to enable you to meet the requirements. So it's a fluid engaged discussion with your peers and we just need to be confident that you're going to act professionally and ethically and you're aware of the expectations under the code of conduct. Now, earlier on in my presentation, I said, oh, you know, chartered status is your qualification. So a good equation I always give to people is this. You're generally going to be employed to do a job and you're going to get paid a wage on a monthly basis. Most employers will help get, give you the experience you need to qualify. A lot of good employers will pay your annual subscription fees to be a member. They will also pay your qualifying fees for you to become a chartered member. And at the end of that process, the main beneficiary is you because you will then have your chartered architectural technologies qualification. So it's your qualification. You have to pay an annual subscription every year to retain that like it is with any other body. And the only people that can take that qualification away from you are us if you fall foul of the code of conduct and you're found in breach. But 99 times out of 100, that's not even an issue that you need to worry about as long as you're acting profession professionally and in an ethical manner at all times. Um, also regarding, I did allude to aspiration earlier about your specific conduit to get involved with CIET. So within a region, so give an example, you've got the Greater London region or the West Midlands region or the Northern region, they'll have an aspiration group and they'll also have a region which is generally the more experienced members. But the region and aspiration cross collaborate and they get together remotely and in person and attend the same events. So the region have a budget, the aspiration group have a budget, so you have a local network of members that you can be more involved in and help push it in a direction where you would like to see it go. They both get budgetary support from CIET. We have a national presence through CIET and other roles within the Institute and then we also have international support. So we have centres which are collectives of architectural technology professionals around the world. So we have a Europe centre or an Australasia centre and if there's certain areas where you'd like to go or know a bit more about then we probably know members in those areas who are part of these centres that can help give you a steer on architectural technology in Australia as one example, or architectural technology in Hong Kong. So there's many ways for you to get support by being a registered member with CIAT. Um, and obviously collaboration, I'm a great believer in collaboration. Collaboration is key. Any project you work on, you're going to cross collaborate with other professionals, whether it be a structural engineer, whether it be a specialist in a certain area, whether it be legal or statutory bodies, whether it be other clients or stakeholders involved in the process, you're all pulling in the same direction and you're all striving to achieve the same thing. So I'm not a big fan of working in silos and CIAT likes to cross collaborate. So we've got collaborative agreements with the RIBA, the RICS, the CIOB within the UK. 
but other organisations around the world that would give you an opportunity to practice architectural technology in those areas and get some recognition for the skills and competency that you've got once you become a charter member, which cover New Zealand, America, areas of Australia, areas of Canada, Scandinavia in general. So there's many ways that you can get support and assistance from CIAT. But I suppose the main thing now as graduates within the built environment is, have I got my associate membership? How do I get to charter status? What do I need to work with my employer on? And how long is it going to take me realistically to become a chartered member? Um, that is pretty much my presentation. I said I'm here to help as much as possible. So my direct emails on the screen. I know I'm generally available. I'll try and make myself available. If you'd rather just speak to me individually over the phone, we can arrange that. Obviously, if you want to just follow CIAT on things like Instagram or Twitter, you get quick updates of events or industry initiatives or anything else that might be of interest. So you can just follow us in a more manageable social manner, if you see what I mean. You can add me on LinkedIn as well. I mean, most of you probably have added me on LinkedIn or we're all in this same graduate construction network group anyway. So I'm available if you want to reach out to me and I will try and help you as much as possible. The one thing I can't do is I can't get you a job, unfortunately. But if you follow me on LinkedIn, then I am posting a few job opportunities as people highlight them to me. Um, that's pretty much my presentation. I know a couple of people joined a bit late. As I said, you can always drop me an email afterwards if you'd like me to run through it again, if you miss most of it. But other than that, I'm just going to send it out to the floor, whether you want to do it verbally or whether you want to do it in the text box, and we'll just do some qu a question and answer session, really. And I don't know if Alex wants to say anything, but thank you for arranging this, Alex. That's fine. No, thank you.